This week was tough, guys. Honestly, I was torn. I could have either reviewed the undoubtedly stellar album that I would have liked, but not get much material out of, the schlocky garbage that, while painful to sit through, would have given me lots of good incompetence to riff on, or the other decent album that I would certainly enjoy, but isn't getting as much buzz as the other two, so not as many people would actually care. So given this difficult decision, which album did I decide to review this week? All three! Here's basically what I did. I knew there was no way to get out of Fallout Boy. It's the most talked about mainstream album of the week. I couldn't escape it no matter how hard I tried. So to help prepare, I created what I like to call the Failure Sandwich, and despite the name, it has nothing to do with a KFC menu item. I listened to the Flaming Lips first, knowing I would probably like it, in hopes to gird my loins before taking on the scourge of douche that Save Rock and Roll would most certainly be, like a Vietnam soldier dropping acid before killing Marlon Brando or however that movie went. Then, after the blood, puke, and other viscous substances have been scoured off the walls, I'd reward myself for making it out alive with the Yeah Yeah Yeah's Mosquito, like a nice after dinner mint after you've eaten an entire bucket of Mr. Creosote sick. That's the order I heard these albums in, and that's the order I'm going to review them in. Don't like it? Too bad. Review the first. My initial suspicions proved correct on the tear as I was lulled into a trippy, melancholy haze by the opening tracks Look the Sun is Rising and Be Free Away. This is probably the bleakest outing the Lips have ever tackled though, and I'm surprised at how well Malaise actually fits their style. The whole album echoes with a numbing painfulness that rips your soul out from its mortal creases and tears it limb from limb in an apathetic, listless, autonomous, and emotionless frenzy. In a good way, that is. The tone of this album isn't woeful or mopey as much as it is resigned to inevitable fate. It's what comfortably numb would sound like if it were having unpleasant midlife crisis-style sex with No More Sorry while Unforgiven peeked in through the window and softly weeped to itself. If you're used to lips work like Yoshimi or At War with the Mystics, then fair warning, this outing might be a little bitter for your palate. But I think it was about, oh, 12 minutes into the song You Lust that a stark realization hit me. How in the embryonic, pink-roboted Zyreka am I supposed to actually review this thing? No, really, think about it. Who would a review of this album actually be for? Flaming Lips fans don't need to hear me rant and rave about it. They've already streamed it, bought it, listened to it a billion times, and bought it again on special edition vinyl with limited edition Wayne Coin codpiece. At the same time, I can't really review it for people who aren't into the group because, while it is hauntingly beautiful, it doesn't serve as a good representation of the band's usual style. As solid as it is, I don't think I would want this to be someone's first exposure to the lips. Hell, it's so soul-crushing in places, I'd be careful who I exposed it to, period. I mean, I do like the Flaming Lips, but even I have to admit, they aren't one of those groups that's going to be everyone's cup of whack as aid and For all the album's strengths, there really isn't enough here to offer anyone who isn't already waist-deep in the Wayne Coin crazy pool the temptation to jump in. So what exactly am I trying trying to say. Well, I liked it. It's a great album. Terrific, even. If you're a Flips fan, picking this one up is a no-brainer. But if not, be warned. This album is no ambassador, and if you're going to get into the band, here isn't the best place to start. It serves as a good place to finish, and even if you aren't initiated, you could still get a kick out of it. But if this is the only Lips album you've heard, you're really not getting the full experience, and it might set up the wrong impression for when you finally do get around to buying a copy of Zyreka and four separate stereo systems to play the damn thing on. I give it a ziggledy corn out of Zook. Let's see some fucking more fucking stage dives, Jesus Christ. My songs know what you did in the dark! Ugh. Having fully ballsed up on postmodern psychedelia, I was ready to leap headfirst into that yawning sarlacc of creative bankruptcy like Boba Fett's stunt double in a not-stupid Star Wars movie. Save Rock and Roll was next on the playlist, and after 41 minutes of writhing, agonizing anticipation, I can report to you good people that this album is... Fine. Just... just fine. <gasps> well, hang on, I didn't say it was good. Christ, this album isn't good by any stretch of the imagination. What it is, is fine. Serviceable. Adequate. It's unexceptional, but also unobjectionable. It's certainly not gonna save rock and roll, as the title so smugly hints at, but it's just competent enough that I can't really call it another nail in the old coffin, either. Judging by the ludicrously obnoxious title of the first single, a title that even an early era Panic of the Disco would laugh out of the room, I figured we'd be due for two-thirds of an hour's worth of tired, dried-out emo pop bollocks, the likes of which died a horrible death around the same time My Chemical Romance started dressing like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hot Topic franchise. I was ready to blast this album in the face with my double-barreled shotgun of musical knowledge and smug pretentiousness, like it was a long-dead zombie with pink hair and a Taking Back Sunday t-shirt, and I was Bruce fucking Campbell. But what ended up kicking down my door wasn't a zombie, but rather a lost and confused house cat that, while perfectly healthy and nimble as any old house cat, was only interesting to watch for a few minutes and couldn't help but cough up a few hairballs before scampering off. 
Fall Out Boy seems to have traded their skinny emo jeans for the slightly looser dungarees of dance rock. A lot of the songs have a poppier feel to them, and most of the grooves wouldn't be terribly out of place on a Maroon 5 album, but for that specific style, I've definitely heard worse. The opening track Phoenix did a decent job of grabbing my attention with a viable mix of strings and synths, and Alone Together and Death Valley were bombast and fluid enough to potentially encourage white boys to embarrass themselves on the dance floor. But don't get too excited, kids. This album is far from haterproof. While the strings, vocals, and synths are decent, everything else about the music is as boilerplate as a hobo's kitchen. Remember last week when I praised Paramore on the superbness of their rhythm section? Well, Fall Out Boy is pretty much the antithesis of that. The drums, bass, and even most of the guitars are so uninteresting and homogenous they almost sound like they're lifted from stock music CDs. And the slow jam Young Volcanoes is so generically Bruno Mars-ish, I wouldn't be surprised to see Mr. Spock doing fuck all in the inevitable music video. Not to mention the inevitable unnecessary cameos. There's one from some colossal douchebag named Big Sean, and another from Courtney tap dancing love of all people that are entirely unnecessary and do nothing but kneecap the tone of the tracks they're in. But these gag-inducing moments aren't as numerous as I was originally expecting, and the album isn't so execrable that I can't sit through it without wanting to physically assault anyone wearing a Cobra Starship t-shirt. I mean, I was tired of it by the end, and I probably won't keep it in my iTunes for much longer, but if you were a Fallout Boy apologist back in the day and have a stronger stomach for Top 40 Pop than I do, then it might be worth checking out. If not, though, you certainly aren't missing out on anything. I agree that rock and roll could use a bit of saving these days, but Fall Out Boy sure as hell isn't the band to do it. I give it two and a half stupid emo haircuts out of five. You know, I was just a wee bit disappointed when I got through Save Rock and Roll without coughing up blood. Here I'd spent a whole week polishing and placarding a space on my worst of the year list for this album, and it just turned out to be mediocre and inoffensive. It really forced me to put on the old hubris hat, I'll tell you that. On the bright side though, I now had the latest from the Yeah Yeah Yeahs to enjoy on its own merits, as opposed to using it as a musical first aid kit. As I pushed play on my iPod, I lounged back in my chair and quietly thought to myself, I wonder how long it's going to take to find an album crappy enough to take Fall Out Boy's spot. Well, that didn't take very long, now did it? When almost every track on an album has me uttering the phrase, what the hell was that, it's not looking at a good write-up. I actually had to listen to this three times throughout the week just to be certain that Fallout Boy hadn't sneakily killed off some of my brain cells without my noticing. But no matter what I tried, I absolutely could not get into this album. And before you start lining up at my door with torches and pitchforks, I'll be one of the first people to say that Fever to Tell was one of the best albums of its decade. Hell, I've been a fan of the Yeah! Times 3 since they first debuted, and I've liked all of their other albums up to this point. However, one of my biggest problems with the band is that for the last 10 years, they've taken the winning, nearly flawless formula of their debut and spent all that time trying to fix things about their sound that weren't fucking broken! And here, all of that experimentation has finally come to a head, and the band is almost completely unrecognizable anymore. There are only two tracks on this album worth listening to, Sacrilege and Area 52. Usually I would go on to compare how the other tracks hold up, but honestly, they all blend together so much it's difficult for me to tell any of them apart. It's literally one of the most boring albums I've listened to this year. The guitars and synths all sound mushy and unorganized, and Karen O, oh, one of the best female shriekers in today's rock scene, sounds like she's half asleep on almost every track. It's like they're trying to do an impression of the XX, but the Yak Cubes are not the XX. If I wanted the XX, I'd listen to the fucking XX! And yeah, I've read some of the other reviews. Apparently this album's doing alright on Metacritic, but I don't care. I couldn't get into it, and I tried as hard as I bloody well could. I was rooting against Fallout Boy the whole time I was listening to it, but it still kinda won me over. I was rooting for this album the whole time, and all it did was disappoint me. Christ, this is what it must feel like to be a Cubs fan. I mean, it's not like I want to say these horrible things. Like I said, I'm a fan. It gives me no pleasure to piddle all over their latest effort. I'm crossing my fingers that on the next album we see a return to form, but I cannot recommend an album, any album, that actually forced me to give a compliment to fucking Fallout Boy. This mosquito gets one can of off out of five. Oh, and in case you didn't hear, Rush was inducted into the Hall of Fame a couple of days ago. I don't really have too much to say on the subject, except... BOOM FUCKING TIME!